You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Twelve. Eighty-nine people nationwide were charged yesterday in connection with an internet-based child pornography ring known as Operation Candyman. This 14-month FBI investigation expects 50 more arrests later this week, and even more in the coming months. <laughs> A report quietly issued by the Canadian government last month raises the possibility of cyber attacks by the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization. According to the Canadian study, Bin Laden and his associates may have been planning cyber attacks against the United States. Welcome to the broadcast. Today's subject is cybercrime and cyberterrorism. Welcome. We're going to do something new with the Special Needs Offenders Program today in that we're following up the Introduction to Cybercrime Program, which was launched back in August and September of 2000. Um, so this program assumes that you are somewhat familiar with the Introduction to Cybercrime uh, bulletin and broadcast, and it also assumes that you're familiar with the Special Needs Offenders close-up on cybercrime and cyber terrorism, which accompanies this broadcast. Um, our main focus today is going to be on what's been happening in the field since introduction to cybercrime. Now, for the objectives of this program. Basically, they're twofold. We want to update you on federal law enforcement oriented news related to cybercrime and cyber terrorism. And we want to provide guidance on how to assess in district needs coordinate resources regarding cybercrime, develop a computer search policy and choose among monitoring and forensic applications, and investigate computer defendants and offenders and develop cyber-specific special conditions. Now, the format for the program is basically going to be that we're going to have three panel discussions for each guidance-oriented objective. Um, some panelists will join us uh, here in the studio, while others will join us on the telephone. Uh, our overall goal is to engage in a focused discussion and to address your questions, concerns, and comments. And you need to help us do that by faxing them in to 1-800-488-0397. That's 1-800-488-0397. Now, that special needs offenders close-up that I referred to on cybercrime and cyberterrorism highlights several initiatives and provides details on initiatives happening at the federal level regarding cybercrime and cyberterrorism. We wanted just to touch on a few of those here today. Um, on the legislative side, perhaps the most important uh, initiative has been the USA Patriot Act, which was enacted after September 11th. That law touches on cybercrime in several sections. Um, and a few months ago, the FJC uh, broadcast a program on the USA Patriot Act um, it doesn't uh, address probation and pretrial services officers or the practices directly, but it's an important piece of legislation to know about because of the direction that it takes cybercrime, uh, what the messages that it sends for policy, et cetera. And we have a short clip from that FJC broadcast to show you now involving a couple of the sections on cybercrime. Let's roll that clip. Several sections seek to update the government's powers concerning modern electronic communications. Similar to Section 219, Section 220 allows for nationwide service of search warrants for electronic surveillance. Section 206 grants roving surveillance authority under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. That is, surveillance can follow the person who uses multiple communications devices or locations. And Sections 214 and 216 expand the government's powers to gather information through pen registers and trap and trace devices. Pen registers capture phone numbers dialed on outgoing telephone calls, and trap and trace devices capture numbers identifying incoming calls. On the executive side, the Department of Justice is also uh, taking several initiatives. 
A few weeks ago, I had the chance to sit down with Chris Painter, who's the deputy chief of the Computer Crime and Intellectual, Intellectual Property Section, I'll never get that one straight, at the Criminal Division at the Justice Department. Uh, and Painter was the assistant U.S. attorney who prosecuted Kevin Mitnick in the Central District, Central District of California. Uh, Mitnick is now under federal supervision. He was one of the original cyberpunks who was prosecuted at the federal level. Um, and I wanted you to have an opportunity to take a look at that discussion, and you'll note in that discussion as well, Painter also touches on the USA Patriot Act in addition to a number of other DOJ initiatives. Let's take a look. Chris Painter, welcome to our program on cybercrime and cyberterrorism. Thank you. Uh, let's start by first talking about definitions. Um, and give us, if you would, the definition, if there is such a thing, of cyberterrorism and contrast that with what has come to be known as cybercrime. Well, I think it's a difficult distinction to make. I think that it's clear that as uh, society and critical uh, information systems, and critical information systems that control things like responses for 911, uh, control systems for companies, uh, everyone is relying more and more on computers. And as attacks are launched on those computers, there's a fear that those attacks could also include terrorist attacks on those computers, which would be cyber terrorism. The problem is it's very difficult in the beginning of a case or even halfway through a case for law enforcement to make that distinction. It's difficult to determine if the, the attack is being launched by someone who is state-sponsored, someone who is a cyber terrorist, or someone who is a 14-year-old from Canada. I mean, there was a case where a lot of the internet uh, major web portals were taken down by a denial of service attack, what's called a denial of service attack, and that ended up being, in fact, a 14-year-old in Canada. Uh, what we really have to look at in these cases is both what the intent of the party who's doing the conduct is and what the effect of the conduct is. That the effect is to really affect major information systems, to take them down, to cause problems, uh, to you know, take down the 911 system, for instance. I think we need to look at that as a cyber terrorist event. When we talk about cyber terrorism, then, we are also including, but it's not limited to, acts um, enacted or taken or conducted by uh, state-sponsored or non-state-sponsored international terrorist organizations. Right. It could be, it could be practically anything. And I, and I think it's also clear that just like society as, as a whole is becoming much more computer savvy and has over mm -hmm. the last 10 years, uh, that includes the criminal community, the terrorist community. Uh, everyone is using computers to communicate. And certainly, I think everyone can start using the same systems and the same knowledge that's out there to attack those systems. What are some of the um, federal anti-cybercrime and anti-cyberterrorism initiatives that have been uh, initiated uh, recently? Well, there have been a number of changes. First of all, uh, on, in the legislative arena, the, uh, it's called the USA Patriot Act was passed back, I think signed in November of last year. That did a number of things to enhance uh, both the procedural authorities that are used not just in uh, computer crime cases, but across the board, but particularly how communications occur over the internet, uh, strengthen law enforcement's ability to do things like trap and traces and wiretaps, et cetera. Uh, so that was one element. The other element was to actually strengthen the substantive computer crime law, which is called 18 U.S.C. 1030, to, uh, to provide for a number of things, enhanced penalties for one, uh, a greater uh, definition of loss so that more of these cases can be investigated and prosecuted. There's a limit for certain kinds of attacks that if it doesn't raise to, rise to the level of $5,000 in damage, there's not a federal crime. But now the definition of loss and damage has been expanded, so many more cases, I think, fit within that definition. Also, a crime was added with respect, or a, a provision was added, that an attack on a computer system that affects the administration of justice, the national defense, or national security is now prosecutable clearly as a federal crime. So the, there were those enhancements. That's coupled with a number of things that uh, the Department of Justice has been doing for some time. Uh, I work at the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section. It's a group of approximately 40 lawyers, uh, growing to 40 lawyers. It's now about 25 lawyers in DC that coordinates these cases nationally, does international work, does legislative work, kind of covers the, the waterfront on these cases. Uh, one thing that we've done for some time is train in the field at each of the 94 U.S. Attorney's Office at least one what's called Computer Crime and Telecommunications Coordinator, one AUSA, one prosecutor who actually understands the technology 
understands the law and understands how to prosecute and investigate these cases. Uh, that's been supplemented recently by something, uh, another Department of Justice initiative called the CHIPS Initiative. Mm -hmm. The CHIPS Initiative in 10 U.S. cities created even enhanced ability. They strengthened that network, and because these are network crimes, we need a network of prosecutors and a network of agents to investigate and prosecute these crimes. So you've got stuff, we've got stuff going on at the legislative angle, we've got stuff happening at the operational level. Correct. Um, what about uh, other kinds of uh, uh, actions that are occurring at the national executive level? Well, there are a few things. I mean, first, on, uh, you know, at the FBI, there is the National Infrastructure Protection Center. Uh, that was created a little time ago, mm -hmm. a little while ago, but uh, it focuses on protecting our critical national infrastructure and realizes that a lot of those systems are connected by computers and information technology. Uh, they have squads around the United States in the FBI offices that deal with this, and it's a multi-agency effort. It's not just the FBI, it's the Secret Service, it's the Department of Defense, and their missions are not just the investigation, but the watch and warning effort. Also recently at the White House, there was created something called the Office of Cyberspace Security and, of course, the Homeland Defense Office. Right. But really talking about the Office of Cyberspace Security, it's a group run by Dick Clark at the White House, and there's also now uh, the vice chair of that group is someone named Howard Schmidt, former um, Air Force OSI agent, former Microsoft person, but a lot of attention to coordinate these efforts, the outreach efforts, the training efforts, uh, the law enforcement efforts, the watch and warning efforts, all of those things uh, around the national government. Very good. Um, we're running low on time, so I wanted to get to uh, using some of your background as an assistant U.S. attorney. Um, and talk about some of the tips, if you have any, for probation and pretrial services officers with regard to developing special release conditions or uh, things they should do uh, when supervising a cyber-savvy defendant or offender. Well, I think, as with any other defendant, you have to look at the characteristics of the defendant and see what you need to do both to protect society and to rehabilitate, to rehabilitate the defendant. So with cyber criminals, you have to look at what they did online. Uh, make sure they're using, I mean, you can have conditions from least restrictive, which are to make sure they use their correct name online and right. don't engage in that kind of fraudulent conduct, to much more restrictive, where if they're a cyber hacker, you may well want to prevent them from having access to any computers, computer equipment, uh, computer-related jobs, that forbid them from being engaged in those for some period of time, uh, access to cellular telephones that they might be able to use to dial into computers. Uh, there are a host and a range of conditions that you can look at, and you should very carefully evaluate the range of conditions uh, prior to sentencing. So it's really important for the officer at, at the sentencing end to make sure that they are clear on the offense conduct and the offender's history of using computers and connected Absolutely. devices as they think about developing cyber-specific special conditions and, uh, and working, therefore, with the court and then with the supervision officer. I mean, certainly when an offender is a recidivist or has shown that they will continue to go back and do this even if prohibited from doing it in the past, there's a very, very important reason to protect society from that kind of conduct, especially given how interconnected we are these days. So you really need to make sure those conditions will protect society. And of course you want to talk about it. You want to make sure that the offender is not tempted to engage in illegal conduct again. Very good. Um, I would, I would say one other thing, I would couple that also with an ability of the probation officer or the pretrial service officer to make sure, that, sure those conditions actually are enforced. And that's a little more difficult in this area. I guess both enforced and enforceable. Correct. I mean, it, it's a little more difficult because when you're dealing with cyberspace, the probation officer can't necessarily watch everything that happens. Right. You can monitor someone's internet activity if they're allowed to have it, but it's very easy to go to an internet cafe, to go so, to some other venue. Right. And it, it poses a real challenge. I so think, I guess it would require a combination of both uh, technical monitoring and sort of using traditional supervision tools. I think that's right. And I also think it means as a practical matter that probation and pretrial services officers uh, need to become familiar and cognizant of the technology that's out there and how it can be used. Very good. Finally, are there things that CCPS, uh, CCPS, as we right. call it, 
can do. One of the uh, many government acronyms. Right. The Computer Crime and Intellectual <laughs> Property section can do um, in terms of training or providing technical assistance to officers. Well, we do a number of training efforts around the country with uh, AUSAs, with agents, with members of the public and outreach. Uh, certainly, we can uh, continue to do those efforts with officers. Uh, if that's acceptable, we certainly are willing to do that. There are also a number of publications we have. The most important one, I think, is to go to our website, which is www.cybercrime.gov. Fairly catchy for a government website. That has, among other things, a manual on searching and seizing computers, recent cases and press releases and indictments, et cetera, from recent cases, uh, and, and a host of other training material that's available. Uh, so certainly check that out, but we, uh, we are happy to provide that kind of training. Great. Well, Chris Painter, thanks very much for being with us today. You're quite welcome. Chris Painter mentioned uh, the website for the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section. I certainly wanted to commend that to you. That, again, is www.cybercrime.gov. Uh, it's a site that I've used in helping to put together this program. And in fact, on that site is an article written by Painter on cyber-specific special conditions for probation. So I would commend that article to you as well. Um, as for the judiciary, several initiatives are occurring. Uh, the AO, Office of Probation and Pretrial Services, uh, has distributed to all chiefs several CDs and a uh, videotape on, uh, com on computer crime or cyber crime. Um, so you want to check that out. Um, also, uh, the AO was represented on the planning committee for this program. Both the Office of General Counsel and the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services have participated throughout the planning process for this Special Needs Offenders Program. Um, finally, uh, the Federal Courts of Appeals are beginning to grapple with cases involving cyber-specific special conditions. Several of those cases are detailed in the close-up, um, and I wanted to just reiterate the importance of those cases. Now they're starting to bubble up from the districts, um, so take note of those as well. If you need details, check out the close-up. And that basically brings us up to date on where things stand now at the federal level. Um, we're going to be back in a minute with our first panel discussion, but before we get to that, uh, we wanted to give you this word from Orange County, California Deputy Probation Officer and uh, cybercrime expert Ed Harrison, and he's going to talk about computers as instruments in crime and the role of the officer. I'm sure when, when Henry Ford developed his automobile. He never thought that it would be used as a getaway car from a bank robbery. I'm sure when, you know, Bell developed the telephone, he never thought it'd be used by these freaks the same way that they are using it. And 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 when folks developed computers, uh, uh, they thought of these wonderful things that would be done with it. There is certainly an element in the the population that criminals, because they're criminals. And they're going to take advantage of whatever weaknesses they can. And certainly the computer is just another tool, the way the getaway car is a tool, the way some of these other tools are there. Uh, a lot of the same scams and grifts that were going on before are now going on at the internet with this um, apparent uh, anonymity that occurs with that. And, and so there's a lot of traditional criminals that have migrated but then there's also the computer element that's just in, in, in enticed by the, the wonders of the computer to be able to do these crimes. It's very awkward for an officer who does not have a background or a comprehension of what computers are all about to supervise that. But then that doesn't mean that they can't supervise that person. Um, and it's, it's just ridiculous to think that a uh, probation officer could be knowledgeable on all of the different kinds of computers that are out there. There's a myriad of operating systems. There's literally tens of thousands of computer programs out there. You can't know them all, nor should you know them all. We are behaviorists. I mean, we're really looking at how someone behaves. The computer is simply an instrument to the crime. We don't need to understand how to ingest drugs in order to supervise a drug offender. We don't need to be able to operate a firearm to be able to supervise someone who's a weapons dealer. But those are certainly traits that help. But it's more about understanding the personality and knowing how to preserve any computer evidence that you may come across so that someone who is an expert could then make a determination and do a proper inquiry into, the, into a possible new crime. Welcome back. In this segment, we hope to provide some guidance on how to assess needs and coordinate resources in your district regarding cybercrime. And to do that, we have several panelists. 
Here in the studio, we've got computer crime specialist Art Boker from the Northern District of Ohio. We have senior U.S. probation officer and cybercrime specialist Brian Kelly from the Eastern District of New York. And United States probation officer Monica Hampton from the District of South Carolina. Welcome all. Monica, this is your second time around having uh, participated on our first Introduction to Cybercrime program, so welcome back. Um, we also are joined by several panelists on the telephone, uh, and joining us from the Middle District of Florida is Chief U.S. Probation Officer Elaine Terenzi. We're also joined by United States Pretrial Services Officer Ruben Morales from the District of Arizona. Uh, also, United States Probation Officer Kathleen Hervatis from the Western District of New York and U.S. Probation Officer Andre Wilson from the District of Columbia. Welcome all. Um, let's start off with you, Art. Uh, and if you could briefly talk to us about the cybercrime initiative that's been going on in your district, tell us how it got started and now uh, where you stand. Well, it started in 1998 with myself and a, uh, another probation officer, Greg Thompson, who's now in the Southern District of Indiana, going to the chief at that time, uh, Keith Kenning, and saying we're getting a lot of computer crime cases, we need to start focusing on this, this area. Uh, we put together a proposal to uh, assess needs, uh, develop techniques for supervising offenders, investigating offenders, and, and equally important, uh, setting up conditions uh, to have imposed in these cases. From that initial start, uh, we focused a lot on the uh, conditions and training and over the years, uh, Greg left and went to Indiana. I continued with training in about year 2000. Uh, I was enrolled in the leadership development program and because of my interest in the computer crime, I proposed as my leadership development project to have a working group to focus on uh, cyber crime. And the new chief, uh, John Pete, agreed that that was a, a good objective. We put together the uh, working group, brought members from all over uh, the office from automation, from pre-sentences, uh, supervisors, deputy chiefs, and we started focusing on the issues. And from there we came up with a, with a manual which was approved within the last week by our supervisors. And uh, we ended up creating a uh, specialist position, which I was lucky enough to get. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, let me stop you there, and then I, I want to go out uh, to Ruben Morales in Arizona. But before we do that, um, just summarize some of the things you said, because you've, uh, summarized, you've, you've, you've pointed out some things that, uh, that we need to focus on. First, uh, your, your district has undergone a change in chiefs, um, and you've continued with this initiative throughout that change. So you've experienced a major change in your district, yet been able to continue with this because you've been able to communicate well with the chief and have them buy into this That's important correct. project. That's correct. Uh, secondly, um, you talked about the inclusion of automation staff in your committee that you formed uh, as a way of bringing them into the fold and letting them know how they can help. Right. We felt it was important to bring as many people to the table on this issue as possible because it's uh, the old saying, uh, more heads are better than one right. uh, type philosophy. And they bring expertise that I can't have uh, because I'm focused on the probation end. So they bring a, a good, good component to the, uh, to the group. One of the other points you mentioned was that this was a grassroots officer initiated uh, project at the very beginning. Uh, and you've sort of helped bring along the management team. And now you've basically got buy-in from, from within your district. Yes. Yes. Very good. All right, let's go out to uh, Ruben Morales, uh, U.S. Pre-Child Services Officer in the District of Arizona. Ruben, if you could just describe how you got started with your initiative and give us sort of the pre-child services perspective. Thanks, Mark. Uh, our initiative arose as a result of, uh, of a case we had that uh, involved cybercrime conditions. And at that time, back in uh, 1999, we had no way of enforcing those or imposing those. So our chief approached us, uh, myself and uh, my counterpart in Phoenix, Rodney Rockamore, and said, you guys uh, learn as much as you can and attend as much training as possible. And uh, we set out to uh, start uh, policies and procedures regarding uh, cyber offenders. Uh, we develop, we're in the process of developing this policy now, and where that sits, uh, it's actually on, uh, on our chief judge's desk, and we've uh, already proposed it to the chief judge, and we will make a presentation uh, in the next few weeks for his approval of that uh, policy. Um, as I indicated, the chief asked myself and Rodney uh, to collect as much information on computer crime as possible 
And then we started developing uh, some resources with other districts to see what's out there, to see what's available, what other folks were doing, and how they were doing it. Um, that turned us on to several forensic uh, programs, and uh, we have been uh, networking with the other districts uh, throughout the whole process. Um, we d developed uh, this approach of uh, monitoring or, or putting a monitoring program in place, and it's a, a work in progress. It's still not... Uh, not the final product, but we're, we're still evolving with it. Okay, let um, me stop you there, Ruben, because again, you've hit on some things that we want to emphasize. Uh, first of all, in contrast to the project in Arts District, your project was sort of uh, initiated by your chief. Your chief came to you and to one of your colleagues and said, take a look at this a little bit more closely, and I think that that's uh, an important distinction. Um, also, you're, you're, like in Arts District, you are taking a more formal approach by uh, proposing policies or developing policies that you're submitting uh, to the uh, management team and to your uh, judges in your district. Um, and you mentioned something that's really important that I think is going to come up a lot over the course of the next hour or so, and that is the importance of networking. You talked about how you networked with other districts uh, in determining what kinds of monitoring and forensic applications were out there. We're going to talk about that a little bit more a bit later on in the program. But those were just some of the things I wanted to emphasize, uh, and, and the audience will notice that these are going to become familiar themes over the course of the broadcast. Um, I want to now come back into the studio to Monica Hampton. And Monica, I'd like you to focus on what's happening in your district. Particularly interesting is what's happening with your task force, your role in that, and then what has occurred as a result of the task force's uh, final report. Well, Mark, as a result of the FTJM broadcast on the intro to cybercrime, um, I brought to the chief's attention that, you know, look, there's a lot of cases out there. I've been supervising a lot of them. So what he thought the best method was was to let's do an assessment of our district, find out what type of crimes we have out there, to what extent is computer crime, pro the computer crime problem in our district. So um, he, he suggested that I spearhead a committee. We call it the uh, computer task force in our district. And I thought the best um, mythology would be to include somebody from every component of the system. Because like art here, I thought that the input from different areas, you know, will help out, give you ideas, and make sure that everything is covered. Mm -hmm. Because you want to make sure that, you know, everything is feasible. You know, you want to make sure if there's money there, there's money there. Right. The pre-sentence writers are, are, you know, getting their input involved in the process as well. Because it affects everyone in the system. Right. And so the first task of the task force was to do the assessment. We went out, we had automation to pull records from PACs and to determine, you know, what particular numbers were out there. And the first uh, slew of numbers was over 600, so we had to narrow it down. We narrowed it, narrowed it down to the crimes that we knew were computer crimes or had components of computers being involved in the offense conduct. An important categorization issue there. Um, mm -hmm. When we talk about cybercrime or computer crime, often we limit ourselves to just uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 1030 or right. sort of the traditional kinds of crimes. That's but right. um, computer crime it perhaps is more often traditional types of offenses that involve the use of computers as an instrument, something like what Ed Harrison was referring to and what That's Chris Painter was referring to in those interviews. That's exactly right, like counterfeiting, for instance. But we wanted the manufacturers. We didn't want the passers. We mm -hmm. wanted the ones that were actually using the, com the computers to, co um, to commit the offenses. And so we narrowed it down. And, and the conclusion of the report was there was about 90 true computer crime cases last year being supervised. And as a result of the upward trend of you know, the supervision issues that we had with computer crimes, the chief decided, well, let's go forward. Let's look at developing more strategies to supervise these type of guys. And so that's where we are now. We're developing strategies. We're looking at a computer monitoring program mm -hmm. to implement. And we plan to launch that sometime at the end of this year. Very good. Okay. Let me stop you there. Yeah. Um, just to summarize a couple of things you said. First, the importance mm -hmm. of background research, needs right. assessment, and taking a systematic approach. Mm -hmm. uh, if folks are able to, if folks want to contact you, would, would you be able to talk to them more about how you did that and, and, and maybe even supply them with, the, with that report? Exactly. Yeah, uh, I mean, that is something that is so important. Art uh, made reference to uh, how his project started out in terms of being appointed a computer crime coordinator along with a colleague and how they kept track of what was going on in their district. Again, took a systematic research-based approach mm -hmm. before they did anything uh, significant in terms of 
uh, initiatives regarding supervision and investigation. That's exactly right. And, and what we've been able to do also is test products like eBlaster, you know, Inspector. Mm -hmm. We've been actually able to, we've had courtesy cases that we've supervised and that task force were tasked with looking at these different products to see if they work and don't work. Very good. Uh, in just a second, I want to go out to Kathleen Hervatitz in uh, New York Western, but before I do that, uh, again, just wanted to emphasize that systematic approach right. and the importance of buy-in from everybody within the district as you proceed with the program and that these are programs that do not do these are initiatives that do not happen overnight. That's right. They, they've been happening over a period of years. Uh, Kathleen, could you um, give us a uh, also a description very briefly of what's been going on in your district and your approach? Uh, sure, Mark. Thank you. Um, our district's initiative arose out of um, two computer seizures that were done in the year 2000. Um, our automation unit can conducted the exams on those systems, but after consultation with the administrative office and other districts throughout the system, our chief determined that the best approach would be to appoint um, an officer to become trained to address cybercrime issues. Um, I was chosen and began consulting with uh, local law enforcement officers to determine the what our training needs really were. I began um, participating in training um, on computer investigations and computer forensics and after the intro to cyber crime broadcast I began networking with other uh, federal probation officers throughout the system who already had initiatives um, that they were involved in. Uh, from those officers I pretty much begged, borrowed and stole the policies, forms, procedures that we've used to incorporate into our own initiatives. Very good. I, I want, again, a, a couple of points you made. First, the, the initiative, your chief came to you uh, and asked you to look into it. It's very similar to what had happened in, in uh, Ruben's office. Um, so that's one point to keep in mind. But also, this notion of beg, begging, borrowing, and stealing is, is, is encouraged um, within this group. Again, you're talking about a group of people uh, who have been networking with each other in very formal ways to create a community of practice in this area uh, and get up to speed on the latest. And because this is such a dynamic area, that is incredibly important to continue to do. Uh, I want to come back in the studio and now turn to Brian Kelly from New York Eastern. Brian, very briefly, if you could just sort of start at where you are now and then maybe work backwards to describe uh, how you got there. Great. Um, in the Eastern District of New York, our program has, is basically a three-year work in progress. And I think any good program is always going to be a work in progress based on new technology, and you want to keep the program updated. Right now, we have a lot of uh, forms in place. Uh, we're formalizing a lot of our procedures, uh, such as the Computer Internet Restriction Program, the Computer Internet Monitoring Program. Um, I, I was appointed cybercrime specialist in October 2000. I'm responsible for a majority of the duties that uh, are involved in that, including super, uh, supervision of all uh, cybercrime cases, excluding sex offenders. We've kept that separate, but we do work hand in hand. Uh, we also created an in-house working group called the uh, Electronics and Internet Training and Investigations Group. Uh, we revamped that to include myself as the chair and officers that will specialize in areas to. Uh, accelerate the learning process. We also uh, want to get someone from automation on board as well as some management uh, positions to help consult and, and get ideas uh, out there. Very good. I think this notion of a work in progress is an important one. I mean, we're talking about initiatives that have begun back in 1998, 1999, and worked from there. So here we are in 2002, and we're still getting up to speed, always getting up to speed in networking. Absolutely. Uh, we, I network with Art, Monica, Kathleen, uh, you know, even planning this broadcast brought a lot of new ideas to the table, a lot of things, different things are going. You don't have to recre recreate the wheel in this type of environment. You can uh, beg, borrow, and steal from other officers and other districts. With permission. Absolutely. Right, right. I want to go out to Elaine Terenzi uh, in the Middle District of Florida because uh, we've mentioned several times the importance of automation and automation staff. And Elaine, I know that you've worked hard to create an environment uh, where there is collaboration and inclusion of automation staff uh, and that you've created something uh, quite special in your district and I was hoping you could describe what's been going on in your district, not just in terms of the cybercrime initiative that has been going on, but how you've created that kind of collaborative environment. Well, we were very fortunate um, from the get-go to have Dan Weiser um, in the district as a person who really sat on both sides of the fence um, as a probation officer who also 
um, was very um, savvy, computer savvy himself. Um, he, he really worked to bridge the gap in, in a lot of different areas um, and was, I believe, the first electronic crime specialist in the country uh, in 1999, although we all know that Dan had worked very hard uh, for years prior to that uh, on cybercrime initiatives. Um, we have our systems managers and our system staff as part of everything that we do. Our systems managers attend our managers' meetings. Our, our system staffs are members of our key policy making committees, our supervision committees, our pre sentence committees. Um, as a court, we have our system staff meeting from all the agencies uh, throughout the court uh, together on a regular basis, generally uh, four or five times a year. So, which also exposes them to the broader perspective, not just of probation and pretrial work, uh, but to the work of the court as well. And um, I think that the key is collaboration and, uh, and communication b between all members of, of the staff because it really is a, a joint process. Excellent. Um, I, I think it's important also to note that um, it's important for the management team to set that tone of collaboration, and I think you've done that quite well, so I really appreciate your contribution to this particular panel discussion. It's an important one, not just to hear from, uh, not just to hear from line officers, but to hear from management and the chief as well, so thank you. Um, we're running out of time, so we need to move to the learning principles that underpin this segment, so let's do that now. Uh, to assess and coordinate resources, as we've heard described, you want to start small. You also want to attain the buy-in of your stakeholders, your automation staff, your management, your judges, etc. You want to keep management apprised and obtain approval if it's an officer-initiated type of project. And you want to use existing successful models. You also want to collaborate and network to create a community of practice. And there are several ways in which officers have been doing that, and those are detailed in the close-up. Finally, you want to develop and you want to implement in-house training. Education and information are key. I want to thank our panelists, both on the phone and here in the studio, for getting us started. Um, don't forget to fax in your questions and comments to 1-800-488-0397. That's 1-800-488-0397. Operators are standing by. Um, and if you fax them in early, we can take them up during the broadcast. Otherwise, we'll have some time set aside toward the end to take up those questions and comments. We'll be back with our second panel in a moment, but after this important message about te managing technology in the era of cybercrime. Defendants and offenders are increasingly cyber savvy. To keep up, chiefs must learn to view themselves as technology managers and overcome three challenges. The first challenge is mental, to believe in technology. Consider how pervasive technology is in our lives. Computers and the Internet are now as common as the landline telephone and its network. Just as phones and networks are used to commit crimes, so are computers and the Internet. Traditional phone systems are used to monitor defendants and offenders. In some districts, computers and the Internet serve similar monitoring functions. However, technology is not a panacea for all of the system's ills, but rather a helpful tool in the management of daily operations. That makes the second challenge strategic, how to fully exploit technology instead of using it simply to automate bureaucratic routines. Mobile computing, handheld devices, and networks can greatly enhance productivity and improve services, including supervision of cybercrime defendants and offenders. Finally, there's the challenge of implementation, how to make it all work. For this, managers may need their system staff, and automation professionals see the world quite differently from probation and pretrial services. Developing excellent relationships with system staff and effective management strategies for their continuous development are key ingredients for successfully implementing technology initiatives. Managers who embrace technology, develop strategies, exploit its benefits, and build collaborative relationships for successful implementation are not only effectively managing technology, they're effectively managing cybercrime defendants and offenders. Welcome back. In this segment, we hope to provide some guidance to districts on developing a computer search policy and choosing among monitoring and forensic applications. Back with us in the studio, our U.S. Probation Officer Brian Kelly 
and Art Boker, welcome, and joined by United States Pretrial Services Officer, and I better make sure I say Senior United States uh, Pretrial Service Officer, Lanny Neuville. Lanny, welcome back. Again, Lanny was uh, with us in our initial program on introduction to cybercrime, and he has stuck with us throughout. Lucky guy that he is. Um, all right. Uh, we're also joined on the telephone by Sean Brewer, U.S. Probation Officer from the District of Kansas. Elaine Terenzi is no longer with us, but the remainder of our uh, uh, panelists are standing by on the telephone. Um, and Sean Brewer in Kansas, I want to start with you. Uh, again, if you could just sort of, we're talking about searches and search policies here. If you could just describe uh, what, uh, how your district started and where you were when you started and now where things stand in terms of your search policy. All right, well, thank you, Mark. First of all, what we did is we created a high technology and computer crime team composed of three members. And looking over our general search policy that we had based on the model of the guidelines, we decided that we needed something more specific to address computers. Uh, so we started doing some research and looked into what other districts were doing, uh, obtained copies of different search policies, um, consulted with our supervision committee in the district and management prior to drafting. And then we started to implement and draft our policy. We um, looked into a lot of computer terminology uh, on how to address those specific computer questions and needs. Uh, once we drafted the policy, uh, we submitted it to our management staff, and they reviewed it. And the management staff wanted the uh, Office of General Counsel's review of, of that policy, which time we sent it to uh, the AO. They reviewed the policy, provided an opinion, and submitted that back to us. Upon receiving that opinion, we altered our program based on the different comments made, suggestions made, um, presented that to our management staff, who then sat down with us during a meeting, reviewed it, made a few minor modifications and, and corrections, and we have since implemented that. It is a lot more specific compared to our general search and seizure policy, which is a plain view policy, in that it is just geared towards computer crime, computer related issues. Okay, let me stop you there. You made a, a several points that we want to highlight. First, um, you already had a general policy in place, uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind, um, and that when you were um, uh, thinking about a computer search policy, you were keeping in mind the model search and seizure guidelines uh, of the Criminal Law Committee. Important place to start, to be sure. Um, also, uh, is the importance of the review that it underwent at different levels, both within your district and by the AO Office of General Counsel. Uh, the revisions that you made after you received the comments and the opinion of the Office of General Counsel, also an important point, and then you went to implementation. Um, something I wanted to ask you, Sean, that we thought was important when we were talking about the broadcast as we were preparing is, what were just some of the major issues that came up as you were uh, drafting the policy? A lot of the major issues were uh, the terminology, Mm -hmm. uh, relating to that and, and approval process and, and the forms needed to, for chain of custody. Uh, our approval process consists of uh, a supervision officer that is supervising a uh, computer savvy offender. Well, if they see the need to do a search of offender's computer, they would consult with their, his or her suspo, at which time uh, that supervising suspo would then pull in that supervision officer with one of our hack committee team members and we would provide some opinions as far as if we thought it was uh, needed or required uh, because at this point the only people that would do the search of the computer would be a, a member of the hack team and if at that point it cleared and all three thought that it was a good idea we would then submit it through our uh, deputy chief or chief they would, or the deputy chief then she would consult with our chief suspect well, or chief, excuse me chief probation officer and that was one of the things we wanted to make sure we included was the fact that we had a hack team member included in that um, to that way that person would be familiar with what was going on and understand what was needed. Very good. I, again, the importance of a systematic approach, practices in place, a sort of a, a thoughtful approach to uh, the different levels of, of, of approval that are going to be needed. Um, I want to switch now back to the studio to uh, Lanny Neuville to get the pretrial services perspective. Uh, Lanny, we actually have our first fax in, which you were kind enough to hand me when you came in the studio, and you're the lucky guy who's going to get it. But um, before that, I want you just to describe what your general approach is in your district, because it's different than what's been going on in Kansas? Well, we, we basically chose an informal approach. Uh, my chief is not wanting right now to implement a formal policy. Uh, we've done a lot of networking with other districts um, and basically uh, have developed procedures that we're following. 
uh, pretty much, or actually in line with the model search policy. We've always kept that in mind, even though we aren't in implementing a policy. We've tried to develop our practices to be in line with that. Um, along with that, we developed what we're calling our Computer Restriction and Monitoring Program, which is a two-part document that has conditions and rules. Uh, we put together a uh, training presentation that we have distributed to our judges. Uh, it's a self-running narrated PowerPoint presentation that discusses legal issues. It talks about uh, the actual monitoring program itself, and we discuss the use of monitoring software and how we chose the products that we're using right now. Uh, we've also developed some training uh, that we've been so far delivering to the new officers in the district, uh, and we're going to be doing some training, I believe, at our next district meeting next year uh, to you know, bring the rest of the officers up to speed. Very good. Um, we, our first fax is from uh, the Pretrial Services Office in uh, the Eastern District of Missouri, and thank you for getting that to us early because now we get to weave it into this uh, part of the discussion, and it's important um, because it's about uh, the ability of pretrial services officers to conduct searches. And the question is this, or the, yes, the question is this. At the pretrial stage, we have no authority to conduct searches, something you've already referred to. Uh, with that in mind, what supervision techniques are available to monitor a defendant's computer or internet use to assure the safety of the community and be certain that defendants are not continuing illegal activity? And in parentheses, it says, filtering and monitoring devices are likened to a search. Response. Well, David Adair has held all along, as far even though we don't have a statute or case law authorizing us to participate in searches, as long as the search is ordered by the court, it's a condition on the, on the bond that we can conduct a search. Uh, he's also held again that uh, the monitoring software is considered a type of search. Uh, so, you know, as long as we've got the condition in place, and and we feel that we need to have a condition from the judge imposing the the installation of the software, also, okay, not just part of it. So you're going to take your cue from the court, correct? And I also think it it goes to uh, the informal approach that your district has taken in terms of the policy, but the not so informal approach that your district has taken in terms of making sure you've got the practices in place and that you've done the training, correct? Um, very good. I, I want to go out now to Kathleen Havaditz again in the Western District of New York uh, to get another probation perspective. Kathleen, if you could just describe how you all conduct, uh, you, uh, how you all approach your searches and, and whether you have a, a formal policy or an informal policy, that kind of thing. Oh, briefly, Mark, we do not have a formal computer search and seizure policy. We um, do, however, have a formal search and seizure policy based on the model search policy and an active um, seizure enforcement team. The supervision officers um, conduct random computer monitoring in the field as they deem appropriate during the course of standard supervision practices. However, when reasonable suspicion is um, present that contraband may exist on the system, our search team will conduct a formal search and seizure, and the system will be seized, and um, an exam would be conducted within our office. Very good. Um, again, I think that this notion of uh, having a general policy in place um, and an active search and seizure team, um, but not a formal um, procedure or formal policy for computer search and seizure. Again, it just re reflects a different approach. Um, and that's one of the things we want the, the audience to get out of this is that there are, the goals may be the same, but the practices and approaches can be different from district to district and just sort of have to be very sensitive to what is tolerable and what will, uh, what, what is, um, what can occur in districts because they have their individual personalities and cultures. We've got another couple of faxes in, um, a couple of them that refer to things we've discussed in our first panel, but we've got our uh, two, pa two of our panelists from that first panel with us. Um, the first question is directed to Brian Kelly. It's from Maureen Kelsey in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Maureen, for sending this in. The question is this, Brian. Um, why, have sex how, why have the sex offenders um, who've committed cyber crimes, or I guess the computer sex offenders, been excluded from your supervision as the cyber crime specialist? We had a sex offender unit already in place prior to us starting our, our cyber, crime, cyber crime program. Uh, based on that and the fact that sex offense uh, 
in my opinion, and I think of, of anyone that supervises sex offenders, it's a, it's a little different approach. There's a mental health aspect of it, and also the approach that if you take away the sex offender's computer, he's still a sex offender. Uh, he's just happened to use technology to implement his crime. Uh, it won't take that away from him. So based on that, we kept it all grouped together in the sex offender group, but we work hand in hand between the monitoring uh, and any type of computer-based searches. So we work directly with them. Now along with that, since we're on the subject of the Eastern District of New York, talk to us a little bit about your, uh, how you approach searches and what you had in place before and how you act now. Okay. Uh, for years, the Eastern District of New York has had a formal general uh, search policy. We have a search enforcement team, which I'm a member of. Uh, we have not, and in, in the near future, don't plan to create a computer-specific search, uh, search policy. The reason being is because uh, under the duties of the cybercrime specialist, um, it's, our, it's my responsibility to be able to handle a computer uh, and, and conduct the search based on tagging the evidence, bringing it back, and conducting a forensic examination. Mm -hmm. We approach uh, each search on a case-by-case -case basis, including the, whether or not a computer is involved. Um, and if the computer is involved, you're going to keep a, a lot of things into uh, consideration. What type of search are you doing? Is it going to be an unannounced home visit, or is it going to be a full-blown-out search? Uh, what type of evidence are you looking for? And also, uh, you know, different systems you may encounter. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about... Um the kinds of applications that you use and the criteria for using those different applications in a minute. But we also got another fax. Thank you, Karen Pace from uh, the District of Utah. I want to direct this to Art. Uh, and the question is this. What are some of the common obstacles or challenges that need to be addressed prior to program imp implementation? I think you have to find out what your problem is with, uh, with cybercrime. How many cases you have. Uh, along with that, the officers uh, need to understand what cybercrime is, uh, what, what is out there, what uh, training uh, through the uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, National White Collar Crime, and get training. From there, you need to get uh, the parties together that uh, uh, management, uh, maybe an aftercare specialist mm -hmm. if it's a sex offender, automation and get them to understand the, the special issues involved in cybercrime and, and if I get them to buy into it and, and uh, to see we really need to work as a team to, to address this issue. Okay, so you need uh, a solid needs assessment and it needs to be, the actions that you take need to be based on research. Right. Um, you uh, need to get your training. Um, you Take, take advantage of some of the resources that have been listed in the Special Needs Offenders Close-Up on Cybercrime and Cyberterrorism and the Introduction to Cybercrime. Introduction to Cybercrime lists some basic uh, training um, information, whereas the uh, Cybercrime and Cyberterrorism Close-Up lists some advanced coursework that you can take. And finally, like you said, get the buy-in. That's right. If you do those things, any obstacles that, that uh, are, are going to be minimized and you're going to be able to overcome them. Very good. Well, yeah, I, Lenny, I'm please. Yes. Is, is one population art left out, and I know it was inadvertent, is the judges. We yeah. have to get the judges to buy in oh, on yeah, this, them. too. Yeah. Uh, and and the, you know, it's a, there's going to be an educational process involved in that, too, because a lot of them don't like computers uh, to begin with, and they don't understand why we have to do something with them to supervise people. Talk a little bit about what you've done in your district, because you've really sort of, in fact, you're making a presentation to, I think, the Fifth Circuit next week yes. or something. Um, well, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned briefly just a few minutes ago what, we, what I did. I, I took a, thankfully, graciously, my boss gave me the time to do it, but it took about three weeks, and I developed a self-running narrated PowerPoint presentation that, you know, I talked about real briefly. We distributed uh, on a limited basis that presentation, uh, and it's fairly well accepted by the judges, and our, our uh, plan right now is that we're going to distribute on CD uh, to all of the judges in the, in the district and possibly even the circuit. We're going to be giving it out to the magistrates at least at, at the circuit conference next week um, to just bring them up to speed with what's happening, the, the increase, and they're already seeing the increase of the cases coming in on their dockets, uh, but also the, some of the complexities of having to, to supervise these defendants, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we need to rely on our traditional supervision methods, we now have to Im Im implement uh, some special tools to be able to, to track them, um, and, you know, trying to ensure that the conditions are followed. Very good. Uh, let me stop you there because we're quickly running out of time. Um, briefly, very briefly, I wanted to talk, uh, start with you, Art, 
talk uh, about the kinds of commercial applications that you use in conducting your supervision work, and particularly the criteria that you use for determining which application to use in a given case. Well, in our district, we want to have the monitoring software installed on anyone that we consider to be a, a computer offender. Um, the reason why is uh, it, it, uh, it's easier to have that monitoring software installed than to go out and do an, a search of a person's computer, especially with the size of computers out there. Uh, it just takes too long and it's too t time consuming. Monitoring provides a way to, to watch them. I know David Adair says the monitoring is a search. I'm glad you touched on I it. think there are, I, the, and there are two programs that we use, and a lot of the districts uh, use them, an eBlaster and Spectre. eBlaster, uh, both of them are installed on the offender's machine, but eBlaster, once it's installed, you don't have to go back out to the offender's machine until you uninstall it. It sends reports to you uh, uh, telling you what the person's doing on their computer, uh, telling you what websites they're going to, keywords that pop up. Spectre records uh, screenshots continuously and saves them on the offender's machine. I think the argument could be made that uh, eBlaster is more of a wi consensual wiretap, mm -hmm. if you were. More surveillance uh, oriented. Correct. Uh, and Spectre, you have to go to the offender's machine, turn it on, and pull that file off. Perhaps more intrusive. Uh, we use those to the monitoring software to uh, to, to provide reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the key keystone in a search: is you got to have the search condition, and then you got to have reasonable suspicion before you do the search. Okay. Uh, we have the search condition. Use the monitoring software to as one component in providing that uh, reasonable suspicion. And I think by using these monitoring uh, softwares and uh, the searches, we're providing the court uh, with a with another option other than just taking the offender's machine away. And I, a lot of circuits are saying you can't do that anymore. Very good. So we're, we're about providing the court options. Right. I mean, uh, we're seeing more and more cases come up from the circuits uh, which are striking down the blanket, uh, no internet, no computer use, uh, especially in cases where you've got a defendant who is a systems administrator or somebody who needs to use a computer in their employment. Um, there are several other forensics and monitoring applications that we wanted to describe, but we're running out of time. All of the ones we wanted to describe here, including computer cop P3 and several others, are described in detail in the cybercrime and cyberterrorism close-up. So I refer, refer you to that. And now we need to get to the learning principles underpinning this segment. In developing a search policy, you want to first consult the Model Search and Seizure Guidelines of the Criminal Law Committee, and then you want to consult the AO Office of General Counsel opinions and what other districts are doing. The goals among districts can be the same, but specific practices and policies can vary. If you're conducting a computer search, you want to do so systematically. You don't want to bite off more than you can chew, and you want to get training, training first. You want to consult best practices manuals. And in choosing among uh, monitoring and forensic applications, you want to do so according to the desired result. What do you want to get out of the tool? And you want to know what the tools can and cannot do. Um, that does it for this segment. Uh, thanks again to our panelists and to those of you on the telephone with us. Uh, don't forget to continue faxing your comments and questions. It's extremely helpful. Um, we'll be back with our final panel in a moment. But first, here are some messages about conducting computer searches and seizures. Our guy did a remote preview of the defendant's hard drive. Yeah, a 60 gig hard drive over the parallel port. It'd take forever to complete. Oh. So he calls the vendor, and they want to know if he's preserving the hard drive for forensics. He says no, he just needs a clean system to install the monitoring software. So they tell him to install it right on the defendant's hard drive. Right on the hard drive? Right on the hard drive. Then he runs a search to pull up all the images as thumbnails. And what does he find? What? Nothing. Nothing? That's good. That's good. But then he does a text search. A text search? Case-related keywords. Preteen, gay, sex. He finds something. He finds files with very questionable titles. Questionable titles? Very questionable titles. Buried deep in the restore directory. I have a restore directory. Yeah, me too. But the point is, our guy finds files made the day before the defendant went to court. What happened? Everything. Our guy calls the AUSA. AUSA calls the case agent. Case agent gets a search warrant. Computer seized. Our guy worries. Our guy worries? Our guy installed the software on the hard drive. Could have rendered evidence inadmissible. Oh, no. Big oh, no. 
especially when the assistant federal defender shows up demanding an explanation. Oh, no. Uh-huh. Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights could have been violated, and now the chief's involved. Oh, no. Our guy explains the court search condition and the fact that we notify the court and the U.S. attorney of potential violations. Chief backs him up. That's that. Nope. Customs forensics examiner called yesterday, found even more images and movies. AUSA will probably file additional charges. And inadmissibility? Not sure. Oh, no. So they found the notebook computer under clothes in a closet. It didn't have a power cord, and the offender said it was from pre-prison days and never used. Who was this guy? He liked teen and preteen porn. He was restricted from having a computer and internet access. So the team tagged the computer and brought it back to the office. A preview found a lot of deleted porn files. What else is new? Well, here's the thing. The offender was unaware of the search, yet on the very morning, he deleted all of his porn files. He didn't know about the search? He didn't know about the search. He must have known about the search. They ran an email search and found several email accounts in the computer Slack areas, and the offender gave permission to look at them. He must have known about the search. Why else would he delete the files? I'm getting to that. One message was from an online file storage and exchange service, where they welcomed our offender to their site and gave him a login and password. When they looked into that site, guess what they found? The deleted files. Yep. Uploaded morning of the search. He admitted it, got revoked, and an additional 10 months prison with two years supervised release. So he didn't know about the search. Once again, welcome back. In this segment, we hope to provide you with some guidance on how to investigate cybercrime defendants and offenders and develop cyber-specific special conditions. Back in the studio with us are Brian Kelly, Art Boker, and Lanny Neuvel. And also remaining on the telephone line are our telephone panelists. Um, Brian, let's start with you this time. If you could describe uh, how you go about conducting an investigation of a cyber offender and some of the tools that you use and how that works. Well, first and foremost, what I try to stress to our officers is that information is the key. You want to accumulate as much information on the offender and his computer use and access as possible. And there are three basic questions that I uh, stress to officers that they can ask at, during the initial pre-sentence interview or upon the initial uh, supervision interview. And this can be done on both computer offenders and non-computer offenders. Uh, the first question is, one, do you own or have access to a personal computer? Two, who is your internet service provider, assuming that all computers have internet access, especially nowadays? And three, what is your email address and or screen names? From those three basic questions, you can get a lot of information and decide whether or not you want to get more detailed. From that point on, we're gonna, we stress to use the computer internet data form. Now that form, uh, I created a short form in our district about two years ago. Art uh, and his district went on and expanded it greatly, and we've since adopted that form because it was so extensive. Uh, we, we've added some things just that we wanted to have, but, but the main uh, form is Art's creation. We have, we have the officers have the defendants fill out that form, and it could be used to, for information purposes where you could stick it in the file and for future reference, or you can use and expand and interview the defendant about why uh, he or she may have certain equipment or have certain levels of access. We also have two... Uh, specific programs in place. One is the computer internet restriction program and the second is the computer internet monitoring program. We've chose to split those up because you may not want or the judge may not want to have every defendant being monitored. Uh, but you do, if a, if a defendant has been convicted of a cyber crime, you do want to have a restriction program in effect. And what the, the restriction program does is it'll have one a general uh, special condition that the offender participate in the program. At the officer level, uh, we then have an extensive contract uh, with different directives and guidelines for the defendant, and you can tailor each contract towards that defendant based on their criminal history, uh, the offense conduct, uh, their education and employment needs, and also, very importantly, on case law in your circuit. Uh, in the Second Circuit, we've just had a major decision come down on U.S. v. Sofsky, which now eliminates um, the ability to the, to the court to order a blanket ban on computer and internet restriction. Uh, so that, that caused a lot of problems for us, but also uh, emphasizes the need for this type of program. Let me stop you there. Sure. Uh, I want to get more into the computer restriction and internet uh, monitoring programs that we've got going on uh, in the various districts, but let's stick to just sort of the investigation tools. I want to go out to Andre Wilson in D.C., um, but you emphasize something again that we want folks in the audience to take note of, and that is the importance of networking collaboration. Brian made reference to his work with Art and Arts District in developing the computer and internet data form that they use in conducting investigation uh, and, and how they've tailored 
tailored each for their own needs in their districts. Um, Andre Wilson, I want to come out to you in the District of Columbia, um, a few blocks away from the FJC. Uh, and if you could just sort of react to the things that Brian has said and talk about some of the more traditional tools that, that you use in conducting an investigation as you're conducting supervision. And you can also provide us with sort of uh, the supervision officer's approach as well as the uh, pre-sentence officer's approach. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, basically, what we do in the District of Columbia is similar to um, what um, Brian outlined. Um, we, in the beginning, we try to obtain as much information as possible on a, if offenders need to use a computer, um, internet service providers that um, accounts, um, screen names, and so forth. And since um, in the District of Columbia, we normally, normally prohibit um, home computer use and restrict internet and connected devices use, used at um, employee employers and basically how we do that is use standard field work and observations um, we go through the homes and do visual surveillance of computers um, look at the computers and see what type of um, um, hardware they have uh, we monitor um, telephone cell phone and credit card bills because those are the, the means of, of how most um, internet service providers um, get paid we also um, um, use mail covers by the US Postal um, Inspector Service you see what type of documents are actually coming into the homes. Um, and you use collateral contacts with family members to see um, how often is a person visiting um, the local library, because that's a place where you can use computers free. Do they belong there in the cyber cafes and, and so forth? So it's, it's plenty of uh, traditional field work um, you know, techniques that can be used uh, um, to monitor um, cybercrime offenders. Excellent. Uh, just to emphasize the importance of those traditional, tried and true methods of supervision and investigation, and that these sort of highfalutin, high tech approaches should merely supplement um, those traditional, tried and true methods. And there's clearly overlap between the two. Um, I wanted to come back into the studio now to Lanny Newville uh, and focus now on, as Brian was talking about, these computer restriction and monitoring programs that you all have, because they are variations on the theme. You guys are all doing it a little bit differently. Um, Lanny, uh, you've been doing this for quite some time. I wanted to talk to you, especially in your pretrial services office, how you all approach it. Well, we uh, <clears throat> created a four-part condition. It's a one, one condition with four different parts on it. And what the condition does is it separates the, the administrative uh, sections of, of how to supervise these guys and what we need from them from what the judge needs to order. And we did that because when we started doing this, we ended up with a laundry list of conditions. And uh, it was real. It, it was difficult to deal with. We had to address every one of the conditions that were on on the order, on our case plan, and it just it was it was really time consuming. We've condensed that now, mm -hmm. uh, and we patterned it after very much after how the electronic monitoring program was put together. Uh, it was a very good model to use to start from. Um, the conditions that we asked the judge to impose are things. What the, the way we separated them out was we wanted the judge to. Uh, make decisions on things that we felt impacted liberties, freedoms, and constitutional issues. So it's, you know, whether or not they can use a computer, whether they can have access to the internet, uh, whether a search is going to be allowed, and, and whether the software can be installed. And then the rest of what needs to be done is, is handled in the, in the uh, rules document that the defendant signs uh, as an agreement. And then it, it basically refer it's referenced by the condition, and they're bound to that as if it was a condition. Very good. I like your reference to the to the EM approach because you're using that. Uh, use you basically are using an existing successful model. Yes. You're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and also from an efficiency standpoint, this is something that serves your your district well. Very much. Um, I wanted to come now to Brian. Just if you could reiterate how your district approaches it. It's a little bit different than the way Lanny does it and the way that Art does it. If you could just elaborate a bit. In regards to the internet, the computer internet monitoring program, we again also based it on our um, EM existing EM program uh, and. Basically, it, it's the same process where an offender would be ordered to, for internet monitoring and he would come in for processing and be processed uh, in the same way he would be processed for EM. Uh, we do we want to stress that, like I said before, that everyone on the monitoring program should be in the restriction program, but not necessarily the other way around. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, take, give us the pre-sentence officer's perspective. I mean, that's where you're, that's where you're coming from here. Well. We want to find out as much information, uh, not only about the, the, where the offender's at when he comes to us, but how did he use an offender in this, or a computer in this particular case, uh -huh. and how do, has he used a computer in prior conduct? Uh, I think those things are important to know. And again, 
uh, same questions of uh, does that person need a, a computer uh, for work, education, uh, is there family in the house that has to have a computer, those types of things. And then from there, uh, we decide what type of condition would be appropriate, either uh, a computer with monitoring and or allowed internet access, or a computer with no internet access, or possibly no computer or internet access. And another case of where we're borrowing from each district, mm -hmm. We use uh, pretty much the same form that Lanny's referring mm -hmm. to as, you know, the restrictions, that the laundry list of things that you need to, to help you supervise the case. And Excellent. we borrowed it from them and tweaked it. Uh, so a lot of networking going on. Very good. Um, I wanted to go out to Ruben Morales in just a moment to talk about courtesy cases, switching gears a little bit here, uh, because uh, when we were planning this broadcast, it came up several times um, that it's important for us to talk about courtesy cases, particularly in situations, since this is a national system, you've got defendants and offenders going from district to district oftentimes, and you've got districts that are di at different degrees of sophistication and complexity in terms of their understanding of computers and connected devices and networks. So Ruben, um, if, give us an example, if you would, of a courtesy case that you've had to deal with and some of the issues that have arisen. Uh, one of the cases that comes to mind is a case that came in where the defendant uh, was not only under cybercrime conditions, but also was deaf and mute. So we had two different uh, um, things to consider there. Um, the uh, host district was not as sophisticated as we were here in, in Arizona regarding monitoring the defendant and being able to uh, install software and, and see what's going on. Uh, the other um, factor on this defendant is that uh, he was a, a Unix administrator, and uh, we seem to be getting a lot of these technical folks that uh, are really, really, really computer savvy. And one of the things that we ran into is that we uh, we had to be patient and uh, and work with the host district to uh, to try and get the, the conditions modified so that we could allow um, the, our software to be installed and our monitoring to take place. And that was the, one of the biggest things is when we are receiving or sending cases that we, we learn to keep that in mind is that you have to, uh, uh, like you said, take into account where the other districts are at and where you're at in relation to having a, a cybercrime program or being able to uh, supervise somebody who has these conditions. Very good, thanks. Uh, I want to now turn again to Lanny. Uh, also, if you could just give us an example of a courtesy case and if you could maybe even react to some of the things that Ruben has said. You're both pretrial services officers. You both deal with this on a regular basis in your districts. I think the, you know, Ruben hit on it. The key to this is, is communication between the districts. We, you know, it's as easy, easy as picking up the telephone. Uh, when I'm getting ready to make a recommendation on a case that we've, we've interviewed, and I know we live someplace else, call them and say, this is what we generally do. Can you guys handle it or not? Because, I mean, we don't want to ha ask the judge to impose conditions that the other district cannot implement. Um, we uh, have had several cases come in where we had problems. We had a, a, a man transfer in from another district who had traveled from San Antonio to the other district, uh, basically to have sex with what he thought was a 13-year-old child. Mm -hmm. And uh, what ended up happening was we got a, a general blanket condition basically saying that the man couldn't use a computer, but there was nothing with that condition that authorized us to monitor or gave us any way you know, to even go into the man's house other than just maybe on a, on a supervision visit. But we couldn't conduct a search, so there's no way to, to, to manage it. So we contacted them and asked them, basically sent them what we use and, and said, can you implement at least part of this to allow us to do it. The other important thing that came along with that is that, that uh, in cases, especially when there is a real or perceived victim, we, you know, we think it's very important to take a look geographically where the defendant lives. This particular defendant lived within a mile and a half of three elementary schools and a middle school, mm -hmm. which was you know, right at the target age of who, who his victim was. So we went back also and asked him to impose an electronic monitoring condition because we wanted to limit his access to those victims. You know, he was in a target-rich environment. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, we have another fax, this time from Terry Smith in the Western District of Michigan. Thank you, Terry. Um, this is directed toward Art. Um, here's the question. Officers in the Western District of Michigan are discouraged from doing search and seizure. However, officers have become affiants in law enforcement officers for law enforcement officers to confront offenders with either consent to search forms uh, or search warrants. Are there currently special conditions available to mandate that offenders submit to a search of their computer systems by law enforcement officers designated by the probation officer for this purpose? 
and reactions? I, I think you could modify the conditions that uh, uh, allow a uh, search to take place by a probation officer by inserting uh, the words uh, or law enforcement. Uh, I personally wouldn't want to do that because you could be cut out of the loop. Uh, and there was a recent Supreme Court case, uh, not a computer case, Knight, uh, the Knight case. Right, and that involved a uh, California state probation officer, a county probation officer. Right, and they had a condition that probation or law enforcement uh, could conduct a search, a warrantless search. Uh, there, there is, uh, you, you could insert it there. I, myself, our district, I would not want to do that. We could get cut out of the loop. Okay. Uh, but I have seen conditions where um, probation will uh, direct who they want to, to do the search. You have to be careful also f about the stocking cor uh, horse uh, issue right. where you're not working for law enforcement uh, on, those, right. on those cases. Right, right, good point. If um, I can, uh, yeah, please, if I was going to just break in. Um, one of the consent to form search forms that we use, the wording does include uh, a third party designation. Just in the case that if for whatever reason, due to us not having a full functioning forensic lab that we want to send it out or use a, a secret service or a New York City Police Department, which do have full functioning forensic labs. If we need to do that, that's already in place. Very good. I, I think the, the message is here, Terry, handle with care. Lanny? I was going to say, I think it's also important, and I think this goes back to some case law that I read, but I'm not sure which case it was. <laughs> as long as the probation officer maintains control of the search and directs it, that that issue, the stalking horse issue, isn't going to come up, and, and we also are not going to uh, subject ourselves to you know to problems with with law enforcement. Good point. I was I wanted to throw this open also to our telephone panelists. Do any of you have a reaction to Terry's question, Andre or um, or Sean? Um, no, that, I was going to um, touch on what Lanny said. Is just to make sure that. Um, the probation officer actually controls the search uh, or, and directs the law enforcement um, officer, officers on what to do. Sean, any reactions? Just that we have uh, networked with the local KBI, Kansas Bureau of Investigation, the Shawnee County uh, Sheriff's Office who have computer crime units to maybe provide assistance to us in doing it since they are more qualified and trained than we are. Mm -hmm. But as Art said, we would want to make sure that we're in control and that we're not out of the loop per se. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, again, it's, it's sort of something that you want to be careful uh, to, to do if you're going to do it, as our panelists have pointed out. Also, the question in a more general sense uh, raises that issue of how districts so, are so individual and sort of have their own approaches to these kinds of things that you need to create a policy that, uh, that is sensitive to those idiosyncrasies of, of your district. Um, so thank you, Terry, very much for the question, a good one that I think a lot of people wanted to know the answer to. Um, I, I, we have several minutes left in, uh, in the program. Um, I wanted to go to the learning principles for this segment now. Okay, uh, in investigating cybercrime defendants and offenders, you want to develop a, develop a specific approach to collect information about the defendant's or offender's capacity with computers. You want to use tried and true investigation methods to identify issues related to computer use. And you want to understand the alleged offense conduct by combining information on technical and non-technical capacity. In developing cyber-specific special conditions, they should be efficient, enforceable, and flexible. They have to correspond with circuit precedent, so you want to be up to speed on that. You've heard it referred to several times here by our panelists. And you want to consider other districts' technical capabilities, especially when we're talking about courtesy cases. Now, uh, that does it for our third and final panel. Again, we have several minutes left in the broadcast in which we hope to take up your further questions, comments, concerns, et cetera. Keep them coming at 1-800-488-0397. Uh, stay with us. And in the meantime, um, we're going to uh, take you through some navigation of the Federal Judicial Center's intranet site so that you can find out more information on this particular program and on special needs offenders programs generally. Let's take a look. Okay. If you want to find any program materials related to special needs offenders, uh, you can find them on the FJC intranet site. Uh, and to get there from the JNET, you would uh, type in jnet.fjc.dcn and hit enter. And that will bring you to the Federal Judicial Center intranet site on the DCN. From there, you can just click on FJC broadcasts on the FJTN 
and that brings you to the general FJTN site and you can scroll down for the most recent programs and you will see special needs offenders, cybercrime and cyberterrorism, for example. Click on it and this brings you to the program specific page where you can download all related program materials. For example, you can download the close-up by clicking here and there it is, special needs offenders close-up, cybercrime and cyberterrorism. And to print, just click on your print icon and you can download all program related materials from this site. If you wanted to uh, find other special needs offenders programs like Introduction to Cybercrime, you would click there and it brings you to the general special needs offenders page where you can find all of the programs and you would click on the link in this case to Introduction to Cybercrime and again it brings up a program specific page where you can download pretty much all of the program materials including the Special Needs Offenders Bulletin for Introduction to Cybercrime. There it is. And again, you would click on the print icon to print. And you'll note that on all of these pages is my contact information. Here's my telephone number and my email address. And you'll find it on the general program information page as well. And back to the Cybercrime and Cyberterrorism page, there's my contact information. You can click on the email address and it will give you uh, a method to email me or you can give me a call on the telephone and that's it. All right, we've got several minutes left in the program and there are a few issues that we touched on earlier that we want to come back to because uh, we didn't have enough time in the, in the individual panel discussions. The first one, which I know the field is very interested in, uh, goes back to this notion of what kinds of uh, monitoring and forensic applications are out there both on the commercial side and on the nonprofit side or the government side. Um, what, what kind of uh, applications are available to use and what criteria do you use to determine which one is appropriate. I want to come to, uh, to Brian Kelly and Brian ask you about uh, ECHO, which is a particular type of application that does certain things and doesn't do certain things. Right. Uh, ECHO is by Pearl Software. We're actively using it in the Eastern District of New York right now. We do also have licenses for Spectre and eBlaster, and that our use of Spectre resulted us in using Echo. And just to give you a brief background, we had Spectre installed on a sex offender who happened to be a violent offender. Mm -hmm. um, doing home contacts had become a problem. I had accompanied the sex offender officer uh, to the home contact. We, we found out that the offender had located the files, deleted them, uh, and then the final uh, home contact uh, resulted in him refusing us access and he ended up being violated from that. Uh, what we needed at that point to address the officer safety issue is we, we, I was asked to try to locate a remote monitoring application uh, and around the same time as part of the New York Electronic Crime uh, Task Force listserv a member had brought up uh, this product the manufacturer of the product came up demoed it we did like it there's a few things you need to know about what it does and what you need to have in okay. place what it allows for is it, it, it two installations. You need to have a dedicated server, which okay. is the first installation. We were lucky enough to have one right in our office. The second installation is the workstation or the offender's computer. Uh, and it's a small file, small application, and nothing is stored on the offender's hard drive other than the application. And what it does is in real time, every time the offender initiates an internet connection, it will shoot out real time data to us, breaking down, capturing all email, all websites visited. And you can basically, if you wanted to, sit there and view his path uh, in real time. What it does not capture is offline activity. Okay. So if that's what you're looking for, this is not maybe not the product, or you might want to use this in conjunction with another product, okay. but it is very useful. So that, uh, just to reiterate, I mean, that means, again, know what your tools can do and what they can't do. And you raised another issue, which is understand the capabilities and levels of sophistication of the defendants and offenders. Um, you mentioned that uh, one of the defendants who had Spectre on his hard drive was able to circumvent it, basically. Right. I mean, that doesn't say that Spectre is not a good product. Exactly. That, uh, it just may not be appropriate for every defendant. Exactly. It just happened so be that we addressed it a need because he's coming back out off the violation and we want something there that we'll know back at our office 
uh, without having to put perhaps an officer at risk to sit there for, it does take some time to view the information off Spectre, Very and good. you're there in the home. Very good. Those are monitoring. We've been talking primarily about monitoring uh, types of applications. I want to uh, shift this a little bit to talking about forensic applications, which are different. And Lanny, I know that you've had some experience probably with the premier forensic application, at least among pretrial uh, pretrial services and probation officers that I've heard about, which is NCASE. Could you talk a little bit about that and how you use it? Well, NCASE uh, is a commercial product and it is rather expensive to get started, uh, but it's also a very good product. Uh, it, it basically automates a lot of the processes that, that are done uh, when we go through training. They train us to ha how to do everything in DOS and it's real time consuming. NCASE kind of integrates all that into one application and just makes it a lot easier to run things. You can go out and, and uh, restore deleted images from, from a hard drive. You can look view uh, internet uh, history. You can do text searches. Um, and although time consuming, but depending on the size of the hard drive, it, it brings a lot of the tools together and you can have several searches running at the same time. I mean, did, um, let me. You, met, you mentioned the cost of the, of the of the application, and I think that's something that it's sort of like the elephant sitting in the middle yeah, of the table, yeah. especially when we're talking about districts with limited resources, and you, know, you don't want to put them all. With, I know you guys would say otherwise, but you don't want to put them all with cybercrime initiatives. I mean, uh, to what degree, in your view, just in your humble opinion, do you think that costs should be a consideration? Actually, when the, what we're doing, I don't think it should be a consideration because okay. I, th I think it's very important uh, and that we need to keep in mind the, the end result of what may happen when we conduct the search. And that is, uh, you know, the, I think my biggest fear is to go out and, and conduct a search on somebody's computer, change something on the computer, find evidence that he's been molesting children, actively molesting children, and then not be able to have the prosecution do something about it. To me, the peace of mind with having a valid forensically sound tool available to avoid that pro that possible problem is, is worth it, uh, and you know the, the product run is runs a little under two thousand dollars to actually purchase the software, so it, it is very expensive. But you know, compare that with you know what the damage is caused to these children when they're when they're harmed. You know, and to me, that's worth it. Okay. You know, yes. about, Art, the, about the cost issue, I wanted to bring out a point. Okay, we've got about one a of, minute left. One of the things we brought out was uh, if you try and hire somebody to do this. It's very expensive. Right. You, if you buy the software yourself, get the training. Get the training. Uh, you can do it a lot cheaper. So in the long run, it can be cost effective. As well as, some districts want to rely on the FBI, Secret Service, right. to do that. They're overburdened. And they're law enforcement. Yeah, and they may, you know, they may say, well, you know, I got all these other cases. So. The priorities are different as well. I think that's an important yeah. thing to keep in mind. It goes back to our: do we involve law enforcement with this or not? Mm -hmm. Monica, I know you had something to say, uh, not just about this, but about right. training as well. Right. Well, I, I agree with Lanny on on the cost of of the software because you know if we look at our mission, our mission is to protect the public, and you know, to me, that is of paramount importance. You know, when you're looking at what you need to buy, what tools we need to have in order to supervise these guys, because we. Would would not want these guys affecting our families, you know, and when we look at our mission, I think that it, it doesn't matter. The price should not matter, you know. We need to get the training, know what it is that is out there, and then tailor it to the needs of that particular offender. Very good. Uh, Ruben Morales, I want to come out to you briefly. Um, we've got about 30 seconds left. If you could just describe some of the training that you've gone through or that you're heading toward that you think would be of value to other pretrial services officers and probation officers. Uh, what we did is we attended the first uh, the first thing was the NW3C the basic data recovery now um, class which was uh, in West Virginia that was helpful we also coordinated with our local or state police and uh, we're lucky in Arizona that they they're uh, one of the pioneers in the country as far as forensics and what we're going to do now is uh, attend a training in Pasadena for in case and we'll be up to speed on that program very good thanks very much um, we run out of time. Uh, I wanted to thank our panelists so much, both on the telephone and certainly here in the studio, for uh, giving us the benefit of your wisdom and knowledge. Um, I also wanted to, on behalf of the Planning Committee and the Federal Judicial Center, especially acknowledge the contribution of the late Dan Weiser, Senior United States Probation Officer and uh, Electronic Information Specialist in the Middle District of Florida. Dan passed away recently, and he was the authority when it came to cybercrime in the field. Um, he was instrumental in helping to develop both this program and the Introduction to Cybercrime program. Therefore, it's only fitting that this program be dedicated to Dan's memory. 
Uh, I want, of course, to thank the audience for faxing in your questions and comments, concerns, and for uh, participating. Don't forget to complete and submit those evaluations. We need to know how we're doing and where we need to improve. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to thank you again for participating, and we will see you next time.